Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. Good morning. I hope all of you are doing well. It's our, I guess, a month or so into our live streaming. And we're hoping and praying that God will open up an opportunity for us to gather all together soon. And I know that they extended the ban another couple of weeks. But let's keep on praying and believing by faith as now we can gather with eight or more people. Uh, let's pray that one day we can all come together and worship. I miss all of you, and I'm hoping that all of you are doing well and staying safe. Uh, let's continue to pray for many people who are either losing jobs or those who are looking for jobs, as many of them have graduated. And I know some of us are facing a lot of other difficulties, whether things at home or maybe things with your extended family. But let's be in prayer and and use this opportunity to depend on the Lord that much more. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 20. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 20, about 16, 17 verses of this. Matthew chapter 20, starting from verse 1 all the way through verse 16. Once again, you can follow along uh, with the notes that's provided for you on our church app. And you could also just uh, fill in those blanks and kind of Uh, get the points down. And one of the things that we will try to do is to have you um, just get more Bible literate. And then as you're taking notes to save those notes and so that you can have a whole collection of just a lot of the different convictions that God has placed in your heart through the different uh, sermons that we are preaching here. So Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 through 16. And we're continuing in our series, Flip the Switch. And as those of you who have probably heard from last week, We started this series because it's from a challenge, a TikTok challenge, where two people who are dressed differently would then flip uh, their outfit and it will be completely different as the light is turned off. And that's kind of what we want you to see in our lives. There are so many things going on in Hong Kong and all over the world. And one of the things that we're praying for is that we can kind of change our perspective on the things that we are seeing right before us. There's a lot of things that God is doing that we cannot see with our human eyes, but He's still working. He's still moving. And we're hoping that God will give us that kind of perspective. And we talked about last week on relationships, how important that is, and how we should look at relationships differently from the way we have been looking at it before. Today, I want to talk about resources and how God has given us time, talents, and treasures, and different things in our lives so that we can use that for the kingdom of God. And I'm praying in these difficult times that the natural tendency is to be more inward focused, to get selfish with our time, to get selfish with our resources and uh, different money or whatever it may be, our talents. But we're praying that we'll look at it differently, especially in these times that we can use everything that we have for the glory of God. So I wanted to uh, start off by asking a question and I'm just wondering if you could kind of think about this for a moment. Uh, which is worse? Uh, you think that you don't have much, but then later on you realize that you did have a lot. Or where you thought you had a lot and then realize that you did it. So I want you to think about that for a moment, that you thought that you didn't have much, but later on you realize that you did have a lot. Or you thought you had a lot, and then later on you realize that you didn't. Uh, let me put this question in an example format so that it can make a little bit more sense. I'm going to give it in two scenarios. The first scenario is this. Is it better to not be generous with people and buy them lunch because you aren't sure if you will have enough money for the rest of the week? So that's scenario number one, that you're not really sure. You're not buying that person lunch because you're not really sure if you have enough resources or money for the rest of the week. The scenario number two is it is simply, is it better to be generous and buy that person lunch, even though you're not sure if there will be enough money for the rest of the week? So I, I'm trying to put it in a more of an example form so you can understand the question. And I think if we're honest this morning, that a lot of us would choose scenario number one. Because I think scenario number one is a, it's a lot safer uh, it's more secure. It, it's, it's very self-protective because number two can be seen as irresponsible, just kind of spending money when you don't have it. Uh, you could put yourself in a very bad situation. So that's another 
thing that causes us to think maybe scenario number one, it's better. Um, But I want you to think about this for a second. But one thing that we forget is that in scenario number two, we are able to see God graciously provide for our needs and increase our faith as we trust in His provisions in our lives. Now, the problem with scenario number one is that we are operating out of a poverty or scarcity mindset, that we don't have enough. And so therefore, we're not going to do this or this. While scenario number two is operating more out of the abundance mindset that says that we have a great God, a big God, and He's willing to give us everything as He sees that we need. And then as we do it for His glory, that He will continue to provide for us. I think both reveal a lot about what we believe in God. The former, scenario number one, believes that God might not provide and that He can't really be trusted. In fact, that we have to trust in ourselves and our own abilities and what we're able to produce. The latter, scenario number two, believes that God is good and He will always provide for His children, no matter what it is, not just financial, but even the time that we use for something that is greater than ourselves, the talents that we use, that He will somehow provide the energy that we need to accomplish more things for His glory. Now, I want to make sure that we don't take this illustration to the extreme. I am not advocating reckless spending. That is not what I'm trying to advocate here. And putting some of you in debt, I don't think that is a very wise thing. There's a lot of Bible passages that talk about not being in debt. And I'm... Not against saving or financial, dis- prudent financial decision. These are all things that are good things and biblical things. What I'm trying to share and what I'm trying to say in all this is that our mindset oftentimes determine how we use our resources for the glory of God. I think especially when things are hard and when we're tested, that really shows what it is that we believe, not only about God, but ourselves. I think in this pandemic, it's easy to be very self-centered, to just think about ourselves or just think about our own family. And we forget about the needs around us. We forget about the other people who are struggling. There are people who are even outside of our church who are going through very difficult times. But I think God has created us in such a way that a self-centered life, it's never fulfilling nor satisfying. And this is something that many of us will have to come to that realization. We have to experience it. That no matter what we have, what we own, or what we experience, if it's all self-centered it's about us, it will never fulfill us and it will never satisfy us. In fact, it leaves us very empty and unfulfilled. I wanted to show you this quick video. And the story is about Kaya Sooner. He is a founder of the COVID Connectors, and in this video, I'll explain a little bit more what that is. And I thought this was really interesting because in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of everything that's going on, there was a need. And in that specific need, he decided to do something. Now, one of the things you're going to realize in this video is that he's just a young, uh, he just graduated from high school, he's just a young teenager. But he wanted to do something, and in that midst of that desire that he had, he just became available to God and just available to say, I'm willing to do whatever it takes and whatever it needs to be done in order to help other people. So let's watch this video together, and then we'll come back. Isn't it amazing how people can use their gifts and talents? And even though we might feel like we don't have much to offer to do something positive, to make a difference. I I love hearing these kind of stories of young people doing something creative and being even entrepreneurial and to go out and to make a difference in this world. It's my hope and prayer that every single person in our church, that we will use all our resources, whatever it may be, so that we can make a difference for Jesus Christ and to glorify Him in all that we do. So today we want to talk about flipping the switch on resources and how we leverage those things that God has given to us so that we can honor Him and glorify Him. So let me give us the one thing. The one thing is simply this. Giving to God is not transactional, but it is rather relational. 
So let me say it again, that giving to God, whether it's your time, your treasures, your talents, whatever it may be, giving to God is not transactional, but rather it is relational. There are two things I'm going to highlight here in this passage in Matthew chapter 20 as we remember about how our giving is not transactional, but rather it's relational. Two things for us to keep in mind is this. The first thing we have to remember is that our expectation of generosity. We have to understand our expectations of generosity. Before I read the passage for today, I want to talk a little bit about the story above, before that came prior to the story in Matthew chapter 20, because I think it's important to put the story in context for you to understand what it is that Jesus was trying to teach. Earlier in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 30, Jesus was addressing this rich young man who approached him and asked him, Jesus, how do, I, uh, uh, how do I receive or obtain this eternal life? And Jesus made it very clear that it cannot be obtained by human effort. In fact, rather, it's by God and God alone and his word. And then the rich man, as you read the story, you'll notice that uh, couldn't let go of the idol of materialistic things or just money of his riches. And then he went away sad. And this is when the disciples began to think. Because they thought to themselves, well, we left everything to follow you, Jesus. So therefore, my reward must be greater. So this is just a human tendency that we see oftentimes in our lives. Well, if this person can't give up riches and they cannot obtain this eternal life, then how much more for us we will receive because we have given up everything to follow Jesus. That's why Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, listen to what uh, it says here in the New Living Translation. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? That's a very transactional mindset that says, God, we have done this for you. Therefore, what is it that we're going to receive? What is it that you're going to do for us? I think this human paradigm really describes so often why the disciples fail to understand early on, even in that relationship with Jesus Christ, why it's not based upon what they do or what they don't do. And I think this is the reason why Jesus wanted them to check their hearts and their motives of why they do what they do. And that's why he gave them the parable in Matthew chapter 20. And this is how these two parts kind of stick together. So let me go ahead and read the first seven verses in Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 through 7. It says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Let's just pause here and look at these seven verses. Uh, I just want to kind of set this up for the main lesson that Jesus was talking about in this parable or in this story. We see that the main character was the master of this house or otherwise known as a landowner. He owned this piece of land. And the other characters were the laborers who agreed to work in this vineyard. And the key point that we have to notice is that there are five different groups of people that, is just, that are described here in the story who agreed to work for this landowner. Now, the reason why it's important to note this is that the five groups of people all ended up working different hours or amount of hours on the vineyard. Some put in 12 hours. That was the first group. That when it says early in the morning, it talks about from 6 a.m. all the way to 6 in the evening. So they put in 12 hours of work on the vineyard. While others put in 9, it says here also 6, and then 3 hours, 
And then the last group of people, they put in one hour of work in the vineyard. Now, it's important to note verse 2. If you look at verse 2, where it says, After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, a denarius is a full day's wage at that time. So therefore, this was the honest pay for honest work. So the amount of work that they put in in that 12 hours was what they were going to get, which is a denarius. Let's continue in the story as we read from verse 8 through 10. It says this, And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, the eleventh hour is the hour before time was up, so they just worked one hour. Now, when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. Let's pause here. Can you imagine what those who worked the first 12 hours, what they felt? Now, I want you to try to imagine this for a moment with me. Because the first group of people that got rewarded or were given the, the amount of work that they did in terms of pay, they were given a denarius. So those people who were working early at 6 in the morning, they're probably thinking, wow, these guys only worked one hour and they got a denarius. Can you imagine how much more we're going to get because we work from 6 in the morning for 12 hours? That was the mindset of these guys in the first group. I want you to notice something. Is that as we talk about this, you'll notice as the last group only worked for an hour and got this full denarius. This revealed a lot of the expectations. Now, look at verse 10 again. In the NIV, it says, When those who came were first hired, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. I want to read you that portion of that phrase that's highlighted in other translations. Listen to what it says. In the New Living Translation, it says, they assumed they would receive more. The New King James Version says, they supposed that they would receive more. And the Passion Translation says that they were convinced that they would receive more. But as you know, at the end, they received the same amount. How would you have felt if this happened to you? And I think this reveals a lot of our our hearts. Because once again, we oftentimes operate on this human paradigm in a very transactional way. That if I do this, then I'm going to get this. Or if you want to look at another way, is that if I do this and I don't get this, then how do you respond? And so what Jesus was doing was he was telling the story to reveal the hearts of the disciples with the previous incident of this rich young ruler who did not want to give up everything but then the disciples were thinking we gave up everything so that means we're going to gain so much more let's finish off this first point with verse 11 and 12 listen to what it says and on receiving it they grumbled at the master of the house saying these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Wow. Once again, I think all of us, uh, every single one of us could probably relate to what was just said. In verse 11, it says, I'm receiving that they grumbled at the master of the house. Listen to some of these other translations to help us to understand the feeling of what they were going through. The New Living Translation says, when they received their pay, they protested. In the New King James Version, it says, and when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. The King James Version says, and when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. And the Passion Translation says, and they realized what had happened. When they realized what had happened, they were offended and complained to the landowner. 
I think many of us, when we think about our lives, this is how we relate to God and in everything that we have. Everything is transactional. That by us doing certain things, that we're expecting God to do something for us. And I just want to share this with you from the bottom of my heart, and I hope you understand that God doesn't work that way. And until we get that, and until we realign our mindset, that everything that we have and everything that we're able to do is by grace and grace alone. And I think it's very difficult, as I share oftentimes, is that living in Asia, this is how we have grown up. This is what we have experienced. I mean, think about ever since you were little, when it comes to your academics. Think about even sports and music and so many other things in your life and in my life. And I realize everything is transactional. Even your relationship with your parents. Oftentimes, it seems more transactional than a deep loving relationship that is unconditional, that's based on the love of God. Even our friendships, oftentimes it is transactional, that you do something for me and I'll do something for you. And this is how our mind is wired up so everything that we see, not just in, around us in our lives, daily lives, but then it creeps into our relationship with God, that it just becomes a very transactional thing rather than something that is deeply relational. This is the classic human paradigm that we talk about quite often, and the equation works like this. If I put in a certain amount of time and effort, then I should get this amount of result or outcome in return. So what do you do when you don't? Get the outcome. Get the results. And I think what this fuels is a very self-centered perspective of Christianity. And if we can be honest with one another and most of all honest with God, I think many of you who are struggling spiritually, part of it is because your whole Christian life is a very self-centered Christianity. It's all about you. And so even quiet time, doing soap, even serving, doing a lot of good things, a lot of it is about you, whether it's your reputation, whether you want to please people, whether you want recognition for yourself, whatever it is, oftentimes our Christianity is surrounded by a lot of our self-centeredness. And this is the reason why God sometimes allows us to go through failure. This is the reason why sometimes God allows certain things to happen in our lives so that it will get our attention to say, this Christianity is not about you. That it's about my glory, as God says. It's about His kingdom. It's about those people that He loves and He cares for. That oftentimes in our self-centeredness, we're blinded to these things around us. And as you know, the story, in the story, God is the landowner. And as He's the landowner, we have to remember that He doesn't need us for anything. But He gives us the privilege of serving Him and experiencing the joy of blessing other people. I think our expectation of God's generosity towards us is rooted in the fact that we think that we deserve something and that God should reward us with the amount of work and effort that we have put in. But God owes us nothing. For us to be able to even serve, for us to be able to even give, to be, for us to even to spend time with the time that we have, it's really a blessing for us. We experience the joy. We experience just lives being transformed before us. That's why I want to just pause for a moment and just kind of help us to unpackage a little bit further on this idea of stewardship because that's what we're really talking about is that God has given us things resources that we have so how are we leveraging that because he has been generous to us how do, how do we become generous to other people and situations around us so it's crucial to remember several things about this idea of just expectation of generosity the first thing is this, we have to talk about our perspective when it comes to generosity, that God is the owner 
of all things. So this is the perspective that we need, that God is the owner of all things. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, read the highlighted yellow with me. It says this in the NIV, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Psalm chapter 50, verse 10 through 12 in the New Living Translation. Listen to what it says. For all the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains, and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. That because he owns everything, everything that we see around us, it's God's. That's why we have to remember that everything that we do have. And some of us are like, but, but pastor, wait a minute. Like, is it really God's? Because I'm the one who put my effort and my time. Just think about some of you who are working. I, I know working is not easy. You have to get up early in the morning. You have to then go to work and face your boss or, or you have to face your employees and as you think about all the different relational conflicts and sometimes some of us are working at places that are very tedious as you think about these things it's really easy to say to yourself i'm the one who is putting the time and effort and so the paycheck that you receive you can say to yourself this is mine because we think to ourselves and it's, it's natural because you're the one who expended the energy you're the one who took the time to do what you did to be rewarded with that paycheck. And as you think about that more and more, you realize that that is not the right perspective because God is the one who gives you the energy. He's the one who gives you breath so you can live, so you can do some of these things. He's the one who gives us life so that we can do what we do. So once again, even though God might not have directly caused it to come into your bank account or even in your life let me just say to you it's God who gives you life so he enables you to do it another thing I want you to notice here is not only our perspective that he owns everything as we think about generosity as we think about what we do with the resources that we have and not make it so transactional but more relational the second thing is our purpose which is we are just stewards of God's resources. We are stewards of God's resources. The word stewardship in the original language is made up of two words. It's simply house and law. These two words in the original language come together to make up this idea of stewardship. Therefore, it has this connotation of exercising of an administrative capacity, or if you want to look at it, a financial management of a household. So simply, it is the administration or management of the property of others, that it's not really yours, but it's someone else's. And you have to remember that we are giving back what has been given to us. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember when I was uh, a, f a second year in college, uh, one of my friends, he had a Porsche 944. Those of you who don't know what it is, uh, it's a nice car back then. Uh, now there's nicer cars. But uh, this friend that I had, uh, he was fairly wealthy so he's from new york and he had this car and so he went home for one of the holidays and he, he and i was planning on staying and so he told me uh you, can you watch over my car and because i don't want it to sit there for all this time you need to start the engine once in a while and i'm like if i'm going to start the engine then let me at least drive it and you could tell on his face he's like mm, but i was like come on like, I'm going to watch your car for you. You know that I know it's expensive, but I'll take good care of it. And I remember, I mean, he was reluctant, but he finally said yes, because I was going to start the car and watch over his car. And I remember getting the keys to this Porsche. And as I was thinking about it, I said to myself, I said, you know what? Like, this is not my car. I wish it was my car, but it is not my car. And I remember I was thinking, what if an accident happens. What if something goes wrong? I was thinking all these crazy thoughts, and I realized I don't have the money to pay for it. So when I was thinking about me not being the owner and just being a steward, I made sure that because it wasn't mine and I didn't want to pay for it if it got into an accident, that I did everything possible to take care of this car knowing that it wasn't mine. Now, for some of us, it might be just the opposite. As some of you know, when you know that it is not yours, 
we tend to be a little bit more free. That's why I think the idea of Airbnb kind of freaked people out in the beginning, that it's not your apartment, but you're someone else's. And as many of you know, when it's yours, you'll take better care of it. But when it's not, we don't really care about what happens. And so a lot of it depends on what it is and who is the person giving it to us in terms of our responsibility. So can you imagine? Here's God of the universe who gives us things in our lives to steward, to manage, that it's not ours, but it's His. And how we leverage and how we use our time, our talents, and our treasures will determine a lot of how that honors God and glorifies Him. Listen to what King David prayed when the people of God gave an offering because he understood this point that he's just a steward or people, we're just stewards of what's already God's. He says in First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14 in the message translation, but me, who am I and who are these, my people, that we should presume to be giving something to you? Everything comes from you. And read the yellow section with me, if you will. All we're doing is giving back what we've been given from your generous hand. What a great reminder. That by us giving to God, we're, already, we're just simply giving back to God which has been given to us by His generosity. This means that we are entrusted with the responsibility. That we have to see it as a calling to use what is given to us to fulfill God's mission and purpose here on this earth. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity. He writes this, Every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given you by God. If you devote every moment of your whole life exclusively to His service, you could not give Him anything that was not, in a sense, His own already. So whether it is our time, whether it's the money that we make from our work or other things, or even the talents and the skills that God enabled us to even have. All these things are given to us by God. And therefore, as we use it for His service, then rather than being transactional, it's a very relational aspect because He gave it to us because He loves us. He wants to bless us. In that way, we want to bless Him. We want to serve Him. And by what we do with what we have, the resources that we have, we're able to show our love for Him, and we're able to glorify Him. So, once again, I talked about the perspective, the purpose, and lastly, I want to talk about our privilege, that we actually get to love God as He uses us to bless others. You know, when you leverage the resources that you have, it's a powerful thing. You're able to become the hands and the feet of Jesus and you're able to communicate something to people around you. I don't know about you, but there, there are many times when God calls me to do something. Sometimes He calls our family to do things. And sometimes it's not very convenient. Sometimes it's very sacrificial. But when, when you, you know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, He just drops it in your heart and you feel this and you know it. It's a prompting from God. And there are times when you calculate, like, God, I don't know if this is possible. Should I spend that much time doing this? Or should, I, should we give that much to that financially? You know, these are thoughts that go through your mind. But you just feel in the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that's in you, that this is what God wants. That there's an opportunity for you to do something that will glorify God, that will encourage somebody. And it's in those moments when we obey and we follow that God does some incredible things. And we're always the ones who are blessed. Like how many times have you given, wh whether it's to a friend or to a need, there might have been a call out to something, and you actually saw that person praising God, and as you look at that, you realize, man, it was worth it. I know that's what a lot of leaders feel at times when we're pouring so much into people around us and we're thinking, is it worth it? But then when we hear the testimonies at the end of the semester or the end of the year that we're able to hear these great things that God has done 
and we think to ourselves, it's worth it. I think this is the reason why Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapters 9, verse 6 and 7. Read the yellow with me. It says this. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly but or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So once again, it's about this relationship that we have, that God gives us the privilege to be able to bless other people and to serve Him. So it is more relational than transactional. How about us this morning? Do you have this kind of proper perspective about God and the resources that you have that God has given to you? I'm wondering if you have this understanding of this biblical stewardship. What are your expectations? Are you making it all about God? If I do this, then you got to do this for me. Are you doing it because it honors Him, it pleases Him, it glorifies Him? Are you still operating on this human paradigm and expecting God to do something because you deserve it? Or you realize, I don't deserve anything, so here's my whole life. Our expectation of generosity is very important for us to understand if we're going to understand that our giving to God is not transactional, but more relational. Let's pause here, and I'm going to give you some time. I know many of you are gathered together in life groups and with other people around you. To those of you who are not, uh, you can go ahead, and there's so many different ways to still participate. Uh, If you are part of a WhatsApp group, uh, just to be able to give out some of your answers if you're by yourself, just different things to do so that, or even your accountability partner, just to be able to send them a message and that this is what you're thinking regarding this question. We're going to take this time to have some huddle group time so we can discuss with one another. And so here are the two questions. The first question is this. In what ways do you find yourself expecting God to do something for you because you did something for Him? Let's just have some deep and honest sharing. Secondly is this. Why is it important to have a proper biblical view of stewardship when it comes to our time, talents, and treasures? So we don't have much time, maybe about six minutes, so maybe you could just pair up and uh, discuss these two questions really quickly. And then after the six uh, minutes, we'll come back together, and then we'll finish off with the second point. I hope all of you had a good time of just discussing with one another. And as we talked about already, that we don't want our giving or even our serving to be transactional, but really more based on this relationship that we have. And as we make it more relational about our relationship with Christ, we'll see God use that for something that's even greater than we can expect. Uh, we talked about our expectation of generosity, but I want to also now, secondly, just talk about and close out our time here with our experience of grace, the grace of God, our experience of grace. Let me just go ahead and finish off verse 13 through 16. If you would just, uh, it's on the screen there, listen to what it says. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. As the workers were complaining about the fairness of this whole situation. It's interesting that the owner responds by stating that he is being fair. He mentions that they all agreed to work for one denarius. Now, it's really interesting. If you look back to verse 2, you will see that it says, after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius uh, a denarius a day. The reason why I found this interesting, because as I was kind of meditating on this passage, I was thinking to myself, did, I'm just curious, was this amount proposed by the laborers? And then the owner said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Let's just go for one denarius, a full day's wage. Or was it that the other way around and the owner said, this is how much I want to give and nothing more, nothing less. But I think we can assume here as we think about Jesus and what he was trying to teach, that they decided one denarius was good enough. 
And as I was thinking about this, I said, what if they knew that this landowner was very generous? Would they have not asked for more? Or would they not have received more? Especially in light of their response. And so I think this is very familiar to a lot of us when we think about this, is that when it comes to knowing God, and as we get to know Him more, I think for many of us, we don't think He's very generous. That's why we don't ask. Or He doesn't care for us enough, so we don't ask. Or we think that God might not be very kind towards us because of things that we have done, so we don't expect anything. And we have no expectations of His generosity. And I think this is the reason why grace, which is something that is undeserved, His favor that is so undeserved, enables to understand more of His heart and more of our own hearts. In verse 14 and 15, I want to quickly highlight a couple things for us. We notice first God's preference. In verse 14, the owner says, I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. I think we forget that whenever God blesses us, it's not because we're so special. It's not because we deserved it. It's because this is what He prefers and He decides to choose us. I was was just thinking about this recently because uh, as I was sharing a little bit of my story to some people, uh, I'm realizing that I don't know why it is that God chose me. I I think about some of my friends. In fact, I just had a a video conference with them, just catching up and sharing some prayer requests and different things like that. And I was just thinking, like, why was it that God chose me uh, out of not only my friends, uh, but so many other people that I was one of the first ones to go and start the church? I don't think I was that much more spiritual than them. I don't think I had that much more talent than some of these guys. But just God, out of His grace and His mercy, something I did not deserve, He decided to choose me. And as I think about that, I, sometimes the more I think about it, the more just I, I, I'm left dumbfounded, kind of lost for words. I'm thinking there's nothing that I did, but it was just purely God choosing me. In His preference, He says, you know what? I'm going to choose you. There's nothing that I did to earn that. Another thing that I want you to notice here, because as we think about God's preference, that's just showing His grace towards us, is also His prerogative. It is His right. In verse 15, the owner says, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? In the same way, if we understand that everything belongs to God, everything, our very lives, it belongs to Him, then He's able to do whatever He wants to do, not only with the things that are around us, but with our own lives. He's able to lead us and guide us to what He desires for us. When you think about God choosing us, And when we realize how much we don't deserve any of these things. And we had no say in receiving this grace and His mercy. It's a powerful thing when you begin to comprehend this. Little as we can in our finite minds that His grace and mercy is so undeserved. But if you look at verse 15 again, the last part of verse 15, we see that the landowner asks, Do you begrudge my generosity? Sometimes it's hard to understand that, but if you look at it from other translation, in the New King James Version, it says, Or is your eye evil because I am good? The New Living Translation says, Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? Now we see the motive of the laborers because we see that everything they they were doing was for themselves and it produced a heart of jealousy. Can I just ask us this morning, how many of you struggle with jealousy? How many of you struggle with comparison? That it's so easy to compare yourselves with other people and if you see them receiving or doing certain things, maybe things that they have that you don't have, it is so easy to then start getting jealous. And I want you to note here that it's coming from this heart that is depraved and wicked. And this is what Jesus is saying when he says, this, everything's mine. Do I not have a right to do what I want to do, which is all mine? 
Why do you then begrudge my generosity? Pretty much what he's saying is that phrase, is your eye evil? Because the eye is the avenue in which we allow things to come in. And even the way we judge people, we judge them from what we see. So instead of rejoicing with people who receive the same amount, what do they do? They complain. It showed that they were entitled. Because we did this much, we should be getting this. Because they received that much for just doing that little. So instead of being grateful that they even have a job, that they can even work, they felt entitled because they felt that it was their right. But as you know, it's God's prerogative. He gets to choose what He wants to do with everything that is His. Then in verse 16, Jesus makes a statement, the last will be first and the first last. I want you to quickly look at chapter 19, verse 30. You would notice that that is the same phrase that Jesus used when the disciples thought that their relationship with Jesus was based on what they did. That rich, that rich man, he, he turned away. But look at us. We surrendered everything. We gave up everything to follow Jesus. So we must get more. And so that he closes out chapter 19 by saying the first, last will be first and first will be last. And now he closes out the story of the workers in the vineyard by giving the same phrase. And what Jesus wanted them to understand is that his relationship with us is based not on what you do, but it's based on his generosity and it's based on his grace. It's not about what we deserve, but it's about what God has done for us. This should humble us. This should cause us to then say, God, if everything is yours and everything that I receive is because of you, then what is it that you want me to do in response to that? Not to receive anything because I've already received everything. But what is it that you want me to do to honor you and to glorify you? God is incredibly and infinitely gracious to us. And we will never be able to pay him back. And we will always receive the things that we don't deserve because of His generosity. This is our experience of grace. This is what we need to understand. So the one thing, once again, giving to God is not transactional, but rather it is relational. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you understand everything that He has done for us, that out of that relationship, in gratitude, we say, God, Here's my life. Do with, with it whatever you desire. Here's my time. Do with it whatever you desire, wherever you want me to invest it in. God, here are my resources. Here's my money. It's not mine. I want to be able to honor you and to serve you in this way. So let me give us some quick next steps as we think about this. And oftentimes when I give the next steps, it's not necessarily, you got to do this, but these are just some thoughts then let the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, how can I then apply this in my life? What does it mean for me? So these are some things to get you thinking towards the things that we talked about. The first thing is this, overcome the poverty mindset. And what I simply mean by that is stop thinking to yourself, I don't have enough. Or comparing yourself. That's a very poverty mindset. But to say, God has given me everything. All the riches in Christ. It might not be material riches, but we have all the spiritual riches in Christ. To be able to operate out of abundance. To say that God, with the time that, that's limited that I have, but I know that you're going to multiply this time. God, I don't have much. I don't even have a job. But I'm trusting that you will provide. Because as I obey you and listen to what it is that you want me to do, that you're going to provide more than enough for me. Exactly what I need. So, so often, many of us have this poverty mindset that says, I don't have enough. So it causes us to be stingy. It causes us to be focused on ourselves. But to ask God for this abundant mindset to go outward and to look. The second thing I want to challenge us with is this. Observe for opportunities to respond in generosity. There are needs everywhere, not just in our church, but needs around us in this world. Maybe God is prompting you to use your time, to use your resources, to use your talents, to be able to bless people around you. 
as some of you know, because of this whole COVID situation uh, and many people have been gone, that it's been very difficult to even continue to meet our budget. And we've been trying to share this with you in different ways. We want to encourage some of you just to be faithful in your giving. And we've said if everyone understood that everything that we have is God's and we're able to leverage some of these things to help build up the kingdom of God, to advance the kingdom of God, there's so many more things that we're able to do. And I know some of us are in difficult situations. And so maybe there's other ways you can be generous in the things that you do. Uh, Some of us, I've been challenging people. We have a whole large graduating class. And this is something that I do every single year. I've been challenging many of these graduates when you forget a job. And many of you will understand this because it's not what you have done. Some of you have applied to like 50 jobs and you're hearing nothing. That if you do end up getting a job, you, I hope you understand. I hope you're humble. Humble enough to understand it's not because you deserved it. There's so many other people who are looking for jobs and just watching the news, hearing like even in China with the number of jobs that are lost and with the one job or the job that opening, there's so many thousands of people trying to fight for that job. If for whatever reason you end up getting the job and not the thousands of other people, I hope you understand it's not because you're so great. Sometimes God gives us things that we don't deserve. And I've been challenging many of these graduates that, as you graduate and you do get a job to tithe your first paycheck, to give it all to, to, to God, to be able to say, God, you're the one who gave me this. This is the first fruit offering. This is, this is the job that you have given me. And you set a tone for the rest of your life that this job, whatever it is, you're not going to be controlled by this, but it's an offering to God to say, God, this is all yours. I'm just challenging some of us in that situation. I'm also challenging some of us who it's so easy to spend so many things on ourselves. That's why I've been challenging people. Look at all the expenses in a given month. Who is it spent on? If it's on you, then once again, something's wrong with that because you're using God's resources just for yourself. Have you blessed somebody this week? Have you bought somebody lunch, some coffee? Have you served? Learn how to look for these opportunities. They're everywhere. Look for some of these opportunities. And third and lastly, offer to God what He has given you. Because once again, it's, it's His. So it's not like we're giving Him something. We're just returning back what's already God's. So offer to Him. Say, God, I'm going to trust you and believe by faith. I think this is a beautiful picture of the gospel, which simply says that none of us deserved anything because we have sinned against the holy God but because of his grace and mercy and when God sent his one and only son to die on the cross that he took our place that should have been us struggling in pain and dying on that cross but Jesus took our place so that we could have eternal life once again it's nothing that you have done we couldn't deserve it we couldn't earn it but it was given to us by God freely That's His grace. And as we receive it by faith, then we can say, God, I am no longer bound by greed. I'm no longer bound by my self-centeredness. But I want to be able to give my life, to give my resources, to give my time, my talents, my treasure, whatever it is, so that I can serve you and give back to you. Not in a transactional way, but in a relational way, because He has first loved us. I pray that that will be your heart as you come to recommit or to receive Christ for the very first time. I wanted to close with this video that's a little bit, uh, it depicts a little bit of what we're talking about. And so often we live lives, we go through the whole day and we just don't think of the needs around us. We miss opportunities to serve. We miss opportunities to bless somebody. And it's kind of a, Uh, kind of cartoonish, but I I want you to watch this because I think it communicates a good message. And sometimes all we can offer to God is our hands. And with that, He can use it for something that's greater. So let's watch this together for a couple minutes and then we'll come back and we'll close out in response. I hope you enjoyed that video and just a good reminder for us that we could just live a life that is just surrounded by our own 
little world. But then we forget that there's a world around us. And it could be as simple as just a hand that we offer to God. Say, this is, this is not my hand, but it's the hand that you have created, you have given me. Uh, it could be your, your voice, your, your lips, words that you say. Some of you are very talented, and I, that's why one of the things I just enjoy working in, in cities like this and working on different university campuses with just young people. It's, it's kind of like the whole world is before you, that your future, your life. And a lot of times that's what fuels sometimes our self-centeredness. We, we forget that it's not about us, but it's about something that's bigger than you. And I'm wondering what would happen if we had that kind of perspective, that everything that we have, everything that we own, we're not the real owners but we're just managers we're stewards and God gives it to us because he deems and in his prerogative he says you know what I'm going to give Seth this gift I'm going to give him this resource and that's just by his grace and you know what he's looking for you know what he does to test me he sees what I will do what God has given to me and if I'm faithful and I use it to proclaim his name and to honor him, use that not in a selfish way, but in a God honoring way, I, I, I realize as I could testify out of being a Christian for almost now four, I'm mean, heading into almost four decades. What I'll say to you is this, that when we remain faithful, that God will then say, you know what? I'm going to give him a little bit more. Or I'm going to give him something else because he was proven faithful with little that he had. Now I want to see if he can be faithful with more. And if I pass that test, he gives me a little bit more. And that is not a poverty mindset. That is a mindset of abundance. That God has everything. And he's just waiting if what we're going to do with what we have in our hands. Are we going to release it? Are we going to give it? Are we going to serve? And as we do that, then God says, you know what? His hands are empty, so I'm going to give him more. Man, I'm praying some of you have a gift of making money. Make a lot of it. Praise the Lord. Make a lot of it. But not for yourself. I have nothing against buying nice things, living in a nice apartment. That's great. But I pray that a good chunk of it will be used to bless other people. Some of you have talents that, man, I know I will never have. And I'm wondering what would happen if you could use some of those talents for the glory of God. No longer about you, about your fame, your prestige, what accolades you can receive. Not to be in the spotlight, but say, God, it's all about you. And I'm wondering if that will impact nations with the talents and the gifts that God has given you. Time, who, who knows how long we have? Who knows how long we're going to live? The Bible tells us that today might be the day that he will call us back home. Can you imagine if all we used was watching Netflix and just doing other things? And once again, I got to always give disclaimers. I am not against Netflix. In fact, uh, my life group, they gave me uh, three months of subscription. Praise the Lord. So, I, so during this interim period before we start the new Caesar ministry, I, I'm, I'm going to be watching some. So there's nothing wrong with it. But what I'm challenging you is this. With the time that we have, if all you do is spend it on yourself, and not just do things and then you're like you know what it's, that's done and I'm going to do this for myself it's done but to be able to use that time to say I don't have much time but the time that I do have it's been afforded to me by God as a gift how do I use this gift to bless somebody else someone who might be lonely somebody who's struggling by themselves I'm going to call them up hey let's get together let me buy you coffee what a way to be a blessing 
I just pray and challenge all of us that we'll have this kind of mindset. Let's not make things so transactional, but relational. Because Jesus loved us, and we want to love him back as we love his purposes and his mission and his people as we share the gospel for his glory. Let's boast about him. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will cause every single one of us with a deeper understanding that you own everything in our lives. All our resources are yours. Help us to flip the switch. The world says that everything we earn, everything we have is ours. But Lord, flip that switch. It, it is yours. All our talents, all our time, all our treasure, they're all yours. And God, help us to go beyond ourselves and see what it is that we can do. As we look for opportunities, as we offer ourselves, and as we overcome this poverty mindset, Lord, make us generous because you are a generous God. And so that we could be a blessing, not only individually, but as a church, we could be a blessing to the nations. So use us, Lord God, for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.